Grow, and we're filming in Manhattan at the IAJE. I'm pleased to have Leslie Johnson, editor of the Mississippi Rag, with me. And this is, uh, we've, we've had a long list of interviewees, but you're our first editor of a publication. So you've, you've done just musicians up to we've this point? We've uh, done mostly musicians. We've done some authors and hmm. critics and um, publicists type of thing, but... Mm -hmm. Um, I thought you did a good job this morning with your panel. I w I'm wondering if the title they thought of for you is true in your mind, which uh, no. I should say was what was a trad jazz. It was called S "Still Swinging." Trad jazz is alive and well. Yeah. And I would have said trad jazz is alive, but but struggling because the audience is getting older, and we have to expand the audience and. We really have to use the internet, I think, to do that. Um, and jazz educators need to be educated about traditional jazz and its value. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's really the key because if the educators don't know anything about the early music, they can't teach it and it, you get farther and farther and farther and farther away from the roots of the music and they're starting much farther down the line without really, really understanding the value of the fundamentals of jazz. or the other thing is the history is so rich with characters and the music is so varied that they're really missing an opportunity, I think, to show how much it's influenced our culture, how jazz is just the language, the clothing. It's, it's really intermeshed with so many things that we just take for granted now, but it really goes back to the beginnings of jazz. Wouldn't it be great if, you know, American history classes taught about it because it doesn't have to just be compartmentalized into a music class. Do you it's know part of our culture? Do you, did you ever hear about the Milwaukee Jazz Experience? No, I guess not. It was something that was started by a guy named um, John Bartles in Milwaukee, and it was I want to say it was the late seventies, maybe seventy eight or so, seventy nine. And John really had a vision that was exactly what you're talking about. And he put on two, I believe it was two events called Milwaukee Jazz Experience. And I participated in it, and Butch Thompson participated in it. A guy named Reggie Buckner, who was the head of jazz studies at the University of Minnesota, was part of it. Um, and what John accomplished is he got the superintendent of schools of, in Milwaukee to cooperate with him and they for a whole and the Milwaukee Journal for a whole year they prepared kids for the Milwaukee Jazz Experience which happened uh, it was still during the school year the end of the school year and the Milwaukee Journal published um, tabloids not real thick but tabloids about it had a timeline historical timeline of jazz and it had um, capsule histories mm -hmm. of the important people in jazz. They also published flashcards of jazz personalities, just like a baseball card, oh. that were used in classes. And they built a curriculum, John and the teachers built a curriculum where it was part of English, it was part of art, it was part of the music class, it was part of the social studies class, and it covered K through 12. Then, for the Milwaukee Jazz Experience, they bust kids in from the local schools to, um, I believe it was Viterbo College. Was that the one? I can't remember what the college was. It was a Catholic college that had agreed to participate. And they turned over the whole campus to, to this Milwaukee Jazz Experience. And it was a, very much of a budgeted sort of mm -hmm. thing. And people paid their own way to come there to participate in it. The clinicians didn't get paid or anything. Oh. But they came in and they gave seminars. But the thing was, the kids came to the concerts and they already knew mm -hmm. something about the music because they'd been prepared for a whole year with these written materials and with the classroom curriculum. So when, for instance, Butch Thompson did um, a whole section, he did a, a very good concert on the blues and he just talked to the kids. But, and he mentioned who, you know, how, how the blues came about and played a little bit and talked about the different musicians and how they differed. 
but the kids could ask intelligent questions. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful project. John did it for two years, and then he unfortunately died of a heart attack, oh. and things just kind of fell apart. The superintendent moved on, Milwaukee Journal, people who were there. I believe Kevin Whitehead was at the Milwaukee Journal at that time, and he'd be a good person to ask about this mm -hmm. because he was very much involved in preparing some of the written materials and covering Milwaukee Jazz experience. Yeah. It was a very ambitious project, and it was head and shoulders and way ahead of the curve as far as any of this jazz curriculum thing is concerned. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited about what Dave Robinson is doing because that's actually the sort of thing that John was trying to accomplish to bring it into the schools for kids much younger. Because if you can get the kids who are young, they really respond to the music, to the early music. Mm -hmm. They're very enthused about it. But if they get to be in high school, it, you, you really have pretty much lost yeah, them. Right. Because little uh, young kids <coughs> won't be, uh, I mean, I think sometimes a problem with presenting this music is the audio quality of some of the original recordings. It just sounds too different to their Old ears. Old timey. But mm -hmm. little kids will not be deterred by that mm -hmm. so much. They uh, respond to the rhythm yeah. of it. And, and they get a kick out of if you play records for them. You know, that whole, the, they're more easily reached, I think. And, um, well, you can dance to it. Yeah. That That's what I think the appeal is. It, mm -hmm. it has a, a quality that just draws you in and it energizes you. I think that's the thing that I really love about traditional jazz and early music. And um, when I would go down to New Orleans and be at Preservation Hall, for instance, we would stay up all night, of course, at jam sessions. But it w the music was so energizing that you didn't get tired. You know, we'd go all night, and then the next night, go all night. And <laughs> but it, the music just had such vitality. And that, I can remember first hearing it when I was a little kid, and it had that quality for me as a six and, si six and seven year old child. I distinctly remember hearing certain tunes by Kid Ory and certain tunes by Duke Ellington and dancing. Were and, your parents I mean, that was my response. They, your they your were, parents were, were into it or not? No, not oh. at all. Not yeah. at all. My mother loved music, but it was more classical, and, and she wasn't all that tuned into it, she, although she became quite a jazz fan as I got involved mm -hmm. in it and went to New Orleans and really did the whole bit and, and was reasonably knowledgeable about it, and my family sort of came into it. But um, no, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a family that was oriented around music. Where did, you, where did you hear it then? I just heard it on the radio. It was played on, you know, there was a, a local DJ who, who okay. liked early jazz, although at that time it you know, wasn't as early as it is <laughs> <Yeah>. now. <laughs> there were still players around like Red Allen. I mean, we're talking oh, yeah. about the, you know, 40s and 50s. Yeah. So it was, um, it was still on the radio. Do you remember the first time that you saw a really good jazz band live? I honestly did not see a jazz band live until I was an adult. Mm -hmm. um, and it was at the Emporium of Jazz uh, in Mendota, which was the jazz mecca for the Twin Cities. Um, I, and I remember going out and seeing Max Morath play out there, who has become an extremely close friend, a dear, oh. dear man. Um, Max, is just a phenomenon <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. There's nobody like Max. I would love to see him here at IAJE doing a talk on ragtime and popular culture. He is absolutely the ultimate entertainer. There is no one who comes close to Max as far as I'm where, concerned. Where does he live? Well, now he is living in Duluth, Minnesota because oh. he married a woman who works for the University of Minnesota as a, I believe as a development director. Yeah. His second wife. He had lived in New York up until maybe five. Oh, gee, no, he's been married to Diane longer than that. Although they lived in in uh, New York up until probably about five years ago. Mm -hmm. She had worked for the U prior to that, and then they got married and they moved here. And then the, the university up in Duluth, that particular branch, offered her a, a good job because she's really good at what she does, and um, and she took it, and so. 
Max Goldhart. <laughs> well, maybe Tim and I will have to go to Duluth. Yeah. Max is wonderful. He yeah. comes to New York every once in a while. Okay. So. Well, I'm, you know, in thinking about this morning, people like to say, why do we have to have categories? I mean, it, it's easy to say that. But in reality, don't you have to... You have to define the terms. You have terms. to define somehow. You I mean, do. Arbor's, his brochure says classic jazz, and that gives you some information. But you can't publish a paper called The Rag. It's, you uh, have to define it, and you, and you have to respect the various genres, too. That's the other part of it. I think I, I agree with Matt when he says it's all good music, but you don't sell it based on it's all good music. And the same with Wycliffe saying, can't it all be considered jazz? But it really can't because people have their favorites and they have right. their favorite genre and they're, they're so different. They all fall under the umbrella of improvisation up to a point until you get into the really arranged materials mm -hmm. that you get in college. But the earlier jazz, it's, it's improvisation. Um, there's, in ragtime, there's a a big deal, you know, there's classic rag and there's folk rag, that there's a, a real division of you play folk ragtime or you play classic ragtime. If you play classic ragtime, you're playing just the notes exactly as the composer wrote it. There's no improvisation whatsoever. Folk ragtime is far m more lilting. It has more of a rolling quality to the music and it's more improvisational. People who, I'll, I'll give you an example, uh, uh, Bob Milne is a a very good ragtime player, and he improvises all over the place. And he was he wrote a book called The Journeyman Piano Player about what it was like, and he still does this, was traveling he all over Was he on Lawrence Welk? No, no, uh-uh, no. Bob Milne? Yeah, okay. M-I-L-N-E. All right. right. Uh, he's, he lives in Michigan, okay. but he's hardly ever there. He's all over mm. the place. Um, and he says, heck, the, the classical composers improvised, Ragtimers improvise. So there's kind of a conflict there, although it's become much less than it used to be. But I would say maybe 10 years ago, that was really a hot topic in the ragtime oh. community. Yeah, that is, that's so interesting, you know. There, so even like, within the genre, there's yeah. hand fighting. And, you and know? Someone used the word this morning, uh, bixophiles. I use that word. Did you use that well, word? Well, yeah, there's that's bixophiles. That's so interesting. I mean, there are just people who are who are crazy about every darn thing you can think of. And that's sort of what your market is, right? Well, that's right. And really the challenge was when I started the paper was, okay, folks, you have to cooperate if you want to have your own publication. Because there had been other publications that had started and the purists said, well, you know, unless you only do it about George Lewis, I'm not buying that publication. Unless you only do it about Bunk Johnson, I don't have any time for it because they were so passionate about their particular musician. Yeah. And, but nobody could exist as a publication. So my very first editorial said, you're gonna have to trust me that I will try and cover whomever it is that you're interested in, but you're gonna have to wait and you're gonna have to read other stuff, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And to their credit, they did. And they have remained, I, I can't tell you how many subscribers I have who have every single issue hmm. of the rag, every single issue, which astounded me when that first started happening, you know, after the first year and I discovered that, you know, it's a tabloid and a newsprint and I thought, well, they'll read it and throw it away. No, they've wow. kept them. Now as they've gotten older, they're, having to downsize and they call up and they say I have 33 years worth of rags I can't bear to throw them out or recycle them what can I do with them mm. and I'll say donate them to a music library take them to a nursing home or give them yeah. to a music school because they c just cannot stand to part with them oh. it's v it's really very very sweet mm -hmm. but uh, they they did 
pay attention to that first editorial. And honestly, that was like a mission statement. And it, I really have not ever deviated from that over all this time. The rag covers a whole, the whole spectrum of traditional jazz. And I do like the term traditional jazz. I don't like the term Dixieland. What about the term trad jazz? Well, trad jazz, I, I, it's fine. It, you know, it's just, it's just a shortcut. And there's really? nothing wrong with that, except some people think of it as being British. I don't oh, myself. Oh, someone else mentioned that. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't think of it as that. I just think it is a, as a shortcut for traditional jazz. Okay. I guess maybe it's things I've seen at some of the festivals. Something about just saying trad makes makes me more likely to think of um, just the the arm garters and the the, the, and the white belts and the striped shirts sort of and thing. the straw hats and now do you think that, that picture in your mind is is makes it harder to promote this music yeah the tricky part of this is there dixieland was actually a fine term way back when both black and white bands used that term it wasn't just a white band that used mm -hmm. the term Dixieland. A lot of the black bands did use it. Uh, Kid Thomas, I believe, he had a band that he called the Dixieland Band, Kid Thomas Dixieland Band. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was not a bad word. What happened was it, it became more of an associated with a novelty music or ice cream social type music rather than serious improvisational jazz. It became a music where the solo was passed around rather than ensemble playing. And that, it, it just changed the whole meaning of that word. And, and what you had, quite frankly, were people that formed a Dixieland band who could only play a little, not a lot. Uh -huh. And so it took on a bad connotation where there were some musicians who didn't want to be associated with that word at all. You never use that word around Wild Bill Davison, for instance. Oh, my goodness. He did not want to be considered no. a Dixieland player. Um, so the trick, but the tricky thing is there are some very good festivals who incorporate that word into their title. There are also some bands who are very good who use that word or say they play Dixieland and you don't want to insult them and say, mm, not a good word because they're actually good musicians. So, but if people ask me, oh, do you cover Dixieland music? I say, well, we like to call it classic jazz or early jazz or traditional jazz because it covers more than, than what would be considered Dixieland. Because I think that's a very, people have a very closed idea of what that music is. If they think that's all traditional jazz is, that's mm -hmm. a mistake. Is the word Dixie in itself problematic? I no, I don't think that that's it. I okay. I think it's really the image of the ice cream social, that that, yeah. and I think that that's that's the concept that a lot of jazz educators have is that they're going to lump it all into Dixieland, and they don't see the scope of the music. Right, and I bet. I I don't think that there's an awful lot of people around who don't consider jazz to be an art form, a legitimate art form. I think that's been pretty much accepted. But I I would agree with you that educators might not think of Dixieland as an art form so much, or, or it's just not... It's not taken seriously. Enough, it yeah, doesn't have any weight heft. to it. Yeah, it doesn't have a heft. It that's doesn't, and, and, and it. what they'll do is a jazz studies program will bring in somebody like Butch Thompson or, or somebody who has somewhat of a name locally. You know, they'll bring in a local artist who is involved with traditional jazz and they'll say, um, we're going to cover Dixieland. You know, we're doing a his the history part of the jazz studies program. Would you come in and do an hour on Dixieland? Oh. And that's, that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, Butch will go in and he'll do the hour. He won't call it Dixieland. He'll talk about early jazz. But if if jazz studies even does that, the yeah. trick is, I don't think that they're even doing it as much as they did before, and the materials haven't been there. 
So, right. so you have jazz educators who don't treat the music with respect, and so they don't learn about it. They aren't stimulated about, by it. Uh, the value of the Ken Burns series was it did bring it to the forefront. There was a lot of controversy about it, and I had some real problems with that series. Mm. But nevertheless, it was treated with some respect, and, and audiences heard the music for the first time. And, you know, I thought there was way too much social commentary in it. Yeah. And I saw it as being divisive and polarizing rather than having what I consider to be the heart of jazz, which is that you bring all sorts of people and races together mm -hmm. in the music. I think it has a very healing quality rather than a polarizing quality, and that was my main complaint with, with his series. Why don't you see two, uh, there's very few black musicians who seem to play in early jazz bands, and traditional jazz bands, at least in my experience. Uh, that's true. Uh, in Ragtime, there's a, a fellow who got a MacArthur grant, Reginald Robinson. Are you familiar with no. Reggie? He's a young black man who taught him, who heard Scott Joplin recordings. He was 13 years old. Reggie, Reginald was 13 years old, Chicago guy. He taught himself how to do the fingering to play Ragtime. And he's really a genius. Taught himself how to play. Bob Kester from Delmark Records um, heard about him and took him under his wing. Uh, Reginald went to, um, I'm not sure what the music school was, and the teacher there said, he does the fingering right, which was astonishing. Because uh -huh. he self-taught he, himself. He's yeah. taught himself. He composes ragtime that is so difficult to play, it's amazing. I, I, he's he really is a, it really is a genius grant in his case hmm. and i think he must be maybe at the time that he really emerged he was only 18 i believe so and that was maybe 10 years ago so he's maybe possibly he's 30 now and he got the grant maybe 4 years ago i think mm -hmm. um but he's one of the few in ragtime there are a couple other uh, black musicians in ragtime. Yeah. In the traditional jazz world, there are very few, and I think that that's because the black community, the musicians, tend to go for for the cutting edge. They're always looking for something different mm -hmm. rather than going back and playing the music that's been played before. I think they they tend to be innovators, mm -hmm. and uh, so I think that they are always looking ahead rather than looking back. I feel bad that they badly that they don't appreciate the tremendous history and the it's in some cases they thought of it as Uncle Tom music because mm -hmm. it was black bands playing for white audiences but having to come in the back door right. so they didn't want anything to do with it. I do think that it's uh, very healthy that Wynton Marsalis has said hey this is worth pursuing and worth learning about. I think he's been very good for the music in that sense and helping black community realize that there's value in that history. Uh, so I really give him credit for that. Good. What's the uh, <laughs> prioritize the, not problems, the issues with doing your newspaper? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd, get, I knew that would get a, a little bit of a groan. <laughs> it's a lot of work and it's it's there's no money in it. I yeah. mean, that's but for anybody who's in traditional jazz, there is no money in it. The festivals are lucky if they break even. Nobody makes any money on it. The the main problem is you're trying to satisfy a lot of different tastes. You're trying to satisfy an audience who's aging and the audience is dwindling. So the challenge is trying to bring in new people um there is no interest on the part of the press. The general press has no interest in traditional jazz. And the rare times that they're kind of forced into doing an article, the articles are rife with errors. And 
it's almost more frustrating to have an article published uh. with the errors than it is mm -hmm. to not have an article at mm -hmm. all. It just makes you want to tear out your hair, really. Um, that's one of the problems. It's because you're serving a small audience, it's expensive to to publish a paper like mine. I, from the very first issue, I paid my writers, which most traditional jazz publications never did. Yeah. I pay them a pittance. I, but on the other hand, they because the rag is respected, they can build a reputation because I will work with writers to refine their writing skills, to help them make contacts, mm -hmm. to give them access to musicians that they wouldn't have access to. Um, Chip Defa, who you probably know Chip, he every book that he writes is he, he writes something and he says you gave me my start oh. and which is very sweet but it's also very true because he's written uh, put together I believe it's four books based on interviews that were first published in the Mississippi rag mm -hmm. and he they're the expanded interviews I edited them down and, and quite honestly I think the edited versions are stronger but he naturally had more material that he wanted to include um, you know, he wanted to include the full interview, but, it, and the books are, I'm very glad that he had the books um, published, but I helped him to find the publishers. I could say, you're, you're not going to like this publisher, they won't work with you, or they're going to expect you to no. do more work, or you're going to end up putting out money and, you know, try this person instead. And so he's done that, and it and it's worked out quite nicely for him. And he's built up a, a good reputation. I think he got his job at the New York Post based largely on the access that he had to the musicians where we ran interviews in the rag. When you look <coughs> ahead at your upcoming year, your <coughs> issues, how do you decide what to focus on and who to ask for articles? Do you call writers? and say, we need uh, time for an article about Mar Marty Gross, or how does that work? Um, I always have more material than I have space oh. for. That has always been the case. So it's a matter of going through what I have on hand or what I know people are working on and determining what the balance is going to be. I, in each issue, I try and have a, an historical article some ragtime feature, some festival feature, and we have regional columns always, and then reviews. Um, one of the most popular things that we run is called the Ragtime Machine, and it's transcriptions of interviews that David Refkin has done at the University of San Francisco. He has a, a radio show called the Ragtime Machine, oh. and he interviews all kinds of ragtime people, and some jazz people, and sends me the transcriptions and we run those because the University of San Francisco has a very limited listening audience. And that's a very popular feature. Um, the, the historical features, somebody, those kind of gen are generated sometimes by me where I have a writer who I, where I think that writer might have access to somebody or we've or I know they have a particular interest. Otherwise, now for instance, David French had written to me and um, he, he kind of came out of the woodwork. I didn't know about him at all, but he wanted to do uh, he wanted to do a piece on Ziggy Elman. And I thought, well, okay. And so we talked and he turned in the initial few pages and I thought, well, that's that's pretty interesting, and he's a good writer. So we worked together and then published that story. And now David is writing the New York column for me, and he's he really is a wonderful writer and a wonderful guy. So we build up that relationship with Chip. He want I'm trying to think of the first article that Chip did for me, and I honestly can't remember at this point because it's so many years ago. But I told him that I'd always wanted an article on Sam Wooding. Mm -hmm. And so he, I, and I can't remember, I mean, there again, we're going back years and years and years. I can't remember who I had access to, but I put Chip onto that person and eventually 
he did we did run a two part interview with Sam Wooding that ended up in one of Chip's um, books, and he formed an, a friendship with family where when Sam Wooding was dying, Chip literally did his last interviewing oh, of him. Wow. Pretty much when Sam Wooding was on his deathbed. I mean, it's quite a story. I ran a story this last summer that had been six years in the making on Thelma Terry. And that was a fellow who was really enamored with her and very little was known about her. It, uh, the fellow who wrote it is a, a philosophy professor at in in Minneapolis. And he, he said, uh, are you interested in Thelma, a story in Thelma Terry? Well, he and I both worked with Thelma's family. He had rounded up her family in Michigan and worked. He went to Michigan. He got them to part with some photos from their from the scrapbook. They didn't know very much about her, and it took six years before we actually got it in print. And I ran it as a two-part story, and it really turned out fantastically well. Um, and in fact, when I saw Dan Morgenstern this last summer. He came up to me and he said, "Thank you for running the story on Thelma oh. Terry. I always oh, wanted to know about her." Yeah. So I thought that was the ultimate compliment. <laughs> Do you have? I know that major newspapers oftentimes have obituaries ready. No, I don't. I'm glad. <laughs> no, I, I hate I, that <laughs> concept. I, you know, I just, it's just don't. It's just like I know they sort of have to, but no, I know uh, it's kind of morbid. Yeah. Uh, no, we don't. But, you know, I have enough material on them where what I try and do is interview them before they die. Yeah, I, of Because course. for one thing, they get so many letters and phone calls from people once we've run the article that it's such a boon to these older musicians to have the article published while they're alive. And sometimes it's such a race against the clock. Yeah. You know, but... I can't tell you how many musicians have said, I've heard from nephews I've, that have been, you know, wow. I haven't known anything of, uh, that they were even around. Or oh. I've had family members call up and say, I heard that you did an article on my uncle or on my grandfather or on this old college friend. Can you give me his address? Wow. And then they're in contact. That, and in fact, in the Grove Dictionary of Jazz, the rag is used as a reference for a lot of the biographies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I will hear from somebody who's read about their grandfather or father or uncle or aunt or in the Grove Dictionary, and then they see that there's a reference to an article, and they'll call and they'll say, do you have that back issue available, which I may or may not have. And somebody has it. I, right. Well, somebody <laughs> has it. I do have, you know, maybe one or two copies of some of the early issues, and and more copies. I always, at once I found out that people saved them or that new subscribers would order back issues mm -hmm. like you can't believe, wow. then I would have a press overrun so that I could sell these back issues. So very often I can provide it, but they'll say, I didn't know anything except that my grandfather was a musician and reading that little bio, now I know something about him and you ran a long article on him. Oh, and that's great. Yeah. It, it is very rewarding to be able to do that. Must have been a, a major decision to go to online publication. Is that something you'd prepared for, thought about for a long time? Well, I had, I had been thinking about it for probably a year and a half, and I had already introduced the subject to my readers who went, <gasps> Yeah. <laughs> no, no, don't do it. Right. Because they were older yeah. um, subscribers, and they were kind of scared of the whole idea, and they didn't understand. They like having a print paper, and I like having a print paper. M you know, my own preference is to have a print paper, but as a small uh, publications editor, I have had so many problems with the post office because of lost issues which have to be replaced at first class rates. You, mm -hmm. you know, so if, if they screwed up a delivery or damaged it or had late delivery, which happened, you know, time after time where people call up and it'd be the 15th of the month and they'd eventually be, I mean, I would publish on the 21st of the month mm -hmm. with the idea hopefully that they would get it by the first of the month. 
A lot of people wouldn't get it until the 15th, maybe the 20th. And they would call up and say I didn't get it. So I would send out a duplicate issue at first class rates. Then they would they, they get would two. get it. They <laughs> would get two. That's right. The interesting thing is very often they get the two on the same oh, day. Okay. Now what does that tell you? Mm. It tells you that the post office, the carrier was either sitting on it or in many cases reading it because when they would get the first one the tab would be broken. Oh my lord. That I cannot tell you how often that happened. And so <laughs> it cost a fortune to be replacing these issues plus the international mail is a tremendous headache to prepare. Um, I knew more about the mailing requirements than the post office did so See, in some cases, I would have to take the pages from the International Mail Manual with me when I would bring the bags of international mail and say, no, this is really the way periodicals postage is supposed to be prepared and <laughs> sent. This is how the tags have to be. Uh, just a tremendous amount of work. And then paper prices keep going up. So there was that. And then I had some health problems where I thought, okay, I'm just going to tell the subscribers, I can't do these all-nighters again and again and again and again. So once I told them that, they said, oh, we love you. Oh, we, yeah, yeah, okay. They, they I mean, relate. they were wonderful and just like that, they've just been converting. So, so they, they, can, they subscribe, but now they're going to access it online. online. Yeah, and so the first online issue came out this last week. I'd wanted to do it by the first, but... I had to convert so many people, plus we reformatted the rag from a tabloid to a um, eight and a half by 11 so that they can yeah. read it and print it easily, and they can read it easier on the screen, and they can print it off. I mean, you can print off a tabloid on eight and a half by 11, but the type is this <laughs> itsy bitsy, you know. So we reformatted it, plus I can use the color. Uh, so that was good, and it, the response, now, so, and then also we redesigned the website. So I've actually been doing all-nighters <laughs> since <laughs> I, I said I'm going to put out the last issue in October. Well, and then also I downsized the office by two-thirds. Oh. So <laughs> so I haven't gotten any sleep yet. That's why I took a nap this afternoon. Um, so just plugging away, and then the online distributor had to set certain things in motion yeah. while we did this conversion. So. It actually, the first one was delivered to subscribers on Wednesday. And uh, I talked to my sister who's monitoring all of this back mm. home in Minnesota. And she said, wow, she said people are real, they love it. Oh, They're great. Finding it easy to download and, and they how love many, the color. How many subscribers do you have? Well, at the, time, it, at the time that I had the print publication, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,600. But the pass-along rate is triple that easily. So we always figured that the readership was between twelve and 15,000 people. Uh -huh. um, there's always a very good response to advertising, for instance, and, and there are people that aren't subscribers because a lot of the, the advertisers are festival producers, and they would say at a festival, how many of you came here because of the Mississippi rag and you know, oh, people are waving okay. their hands and they're not necessarily subscribers. I was going to ask what the, your relationship is with the jazz parties and the, the jazz They festivals. advertise quite heavily. Yeah. And I run free listings for them too. Oh, good. Yeah. And, as well as jazz cruises. Oh, so, right. And I was amazed that when we were doing this conversion to the emails, a lot of the people that I talked to, the older people said, well, I'm going to convert because I can't live without your listings. I go on a jazz cruise every year, and I thought, where, where is this money coming from? Yeah. You know, holy yeah. smoke. Or I go to eight festivals a year, and these are, you know, elderly people, and they are really spending money on jazz. Uh, one woman I talked to had been on 15 jazz cruises. Hmm. I it's it's astonishing so they they wanted to convert because they wanted the listings in many cases uh, other people love the historical articles everybody has their little mm. favorite you know how about the rest of your family are they, <laughs> <laughs> are they uh they have the jazz bug as um, much as you well 
in my own family, my kids are music buffs and they grew up with the music. My son was six when I started the rag, my daughter was three. So they were kind of mascots for the Hall Brothers Jazz Band at the Emporium of Jazz and we had musicians staying with us mm -hmm. and they heard that music all the time. But my own tastes are extremely eclectic and my first husband, it was the same thing. We, we liked everything and so my kids were exposed to every kind of music, really. And uh, my daughter uh, ended up being a music teacher. She teaches middle school in Chicago and she teaches music and her major was, well actually I guess it ended up being education, but uh, she had a very strong major, almost a major in uh, music performance. But then she decided she could affect more people with teaching than she could with performance. So right. she, she went into teaching. But uh, they grew up with that and um, and my second husband, Will, has been involved with jazz his whole life. So it's 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 very much of a musical right. family. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's and they've been everybody in my family has worked for the rag. Everyone. <laughs> okay. Everyone. It, my kids have my nieces, my nephews, my sisters. Uh, Will uh, has written. Will wrote for the very first issue of the rag. He writes a regular column now. Hmm. Um, my ex husband worked for me um, up until just two years ago. Uh, when I started to convert to an electronic publication where he wasn't doing what we used to do the old cut and paste layout yeah you know so uh, Dennis my first husband and I would slap together the paper and you know, <laughs> take it to the printer <laughs> so but a couple years back the printer said the camera departments closing down it's got to be electronic and so that also led to the idea of online if we were going to prepare PDF files might as well put it online yeah. So, do you think you can affect the powers that be at the in the IAJE or or take a part in that in any way? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> yeah, I guess. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, it would have been nice. I mean, in a perfect world. <laughs> I, talking to to Vince last night. I I almost felt like saying, how come you're not playing at this thing? Oh. You know, I mean, it would have been, when I looked at the lineup of the concerts, there's a lot of great stuff here, but it would have been nice to have. Now, Jim Cullum made a big hit last oh, yeah. year. Oh, yeah. Okay, so why isn't there something like that again? I was astonished that there wasn't anything at all, and Vince would be, I mean, here he is local. Yeah. Why wouldn't you hire Vince? Yeah. And Dan Levinson is here. I mean, there are some extremely good classic jazz players in town. Uh, Dave Ostwald's another one, and Dave is very knowledgeable about Louis Armstrong in particular, and and is uh, part of the Satchmo Summerfest in New Orleans. He does seminars and lectures down there, um, and here he's a local musician here he could have been part of this uh, I wonder if those if those people are are promoting themselves as much as everybody else is because the IAJE you you have to apply to do a clinic maybe in your case they tapped you actually that's exactly what happened but I know in my case I have to submit whole go through the whole screening process and all that and I think that what what you have with the the traditional players is a lot of them are just scraping by financially, mm -hmm. and it's similar to my position with the rag, where now my husband now is a very accomplished publicist and has a career with that, and he gets frustrated because I don't promote the rag. But what happens is there's so much effort going into the product, you simply have no brain <laughs> mm -hmm. left. After I, after mm -hmm. I produce the paper, all I want to do is sleep. Yeah. I, I mean, your your energy is with the product. In Vince's case, for instance, or with a lot of the musicians, they're trying to come up with the charts. They're trying to get the right musicians. They're trying to find the time to rehearse, to get to the gig, which doesn't pay very much money. And just the whole process of performing takes so much energy. And they don't right. have the money to do the promotion. So if you don't start out with big money, 
Right. You're really stuck. And when I started the rag, I started with two hundred dollars. I mean, who in their right mind starts a publication with two hundred dollars, mm-hmm. which was borrowed from my insurance company? <laughs> <laughs> you know? wow. So it, you know, it's a cash flow problem, really. If you're going to get a good publicist, you've got to pay him decent money. Right. And if you're going to even get flyers printed up that look professional. It costs money. Mm-hmm. And you say, well, okay, go out and borrow the money. Well, if you're a musician, who's going to loan you money? <laughs> you know, you want to do what? <laughs> well, and when yeah. I started the RAG, I went to the State Arts Board. No, we don't fund, we don't oh. fund publications. Um, there's always that exception. Okay, Small Business Administration, everything but publications. You, you can't get any money. It's, you have to personally guarantee it not you can't borrow it as a business that was what i found when i started so you just bite the bullet and you dive in what who's your biggest uh, competition oh there's a publication on the west coast called the american rag, american rag and that's but it's really very oriented towards the west coast and he's tried to expand it but um it has it has a very different type of presentation from what I do Mm -hmm. and so it's not really I don't really consider it very serious competition except in terms of the advertising dollars but his circulation never was it never has been it it, it, I've always been at least 50 percent more in terms of circulation do you go to things like the annual Bix Beyerbeck festival yourself do you find any reason to go there to promote the the paper in the early years of the rag i used to go to i would go to the bix fest i would always go to the new orleans festival and i would almost always go to the st louis ragtime festival and then sporadically i would go to other festivals i'd been to sacramento and san diego and um some of the jazz parties but it because it's pretty much a one-woman shop mm. putting out the rag, I just found that A, it was too expensive, and B, the time that it would take to tra- to get ready to travel, to travel, come back, get settled in again, and, and being a mother of two kids, mm-hmm. too, you know, that's sure. a complicating factor, too. Um, I, I would get too far behind, and it's just a tremendous amount of work to put out a monthly publication, so... I would suffer from going to these other festivals. And what happened, too, is I had a lot of uh, freelance writers who would say, I'm going to go to the Bix Fest. Do you want me to cover it? Okay. You know, it was cheaper for me to pay them for the photos and for the text than it was for me to go. And they did a good job, you know. So, uh, So it really has segued into more freelancers covering the festivals instead of me. But I did cover a lot of the early ones. Yeah. Took my trusty pen tax and <laughs> <laughs> took lots of pictures. Do you um, ever find that you want to help some bands with some criticism? <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that a tender topic? Yeah. Um, it's very dicey trying to to do that Um, especially with reviews those are really tricky what I tend to do is if if there's a band that that, I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of CDs sitting there to be reviewed or records yeah and I mean it used to be records in the olden days or tapes in the olden days now it's CDs far more than there's ever space to review And if a recording is really bad, I won't assign it to somebody because it doesn't serve any purpose. Once in a while, if there is a band, well, I'll give you an example of musicians who could put out, who are wonderful musicians who put out some sloppy records. Um, Ralph Sutton was one of the most recorded musicians there ever Mm was. And... I dearly loved that man personally and as a musician, but Ralph tended to do the same repertoire 
he, oh. he just, I mean, you could pretty much count on a, a recording coming out, and it was going to have Echo of Spring, and it was, it was uh, oh, he did the same know, song over and over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He it, and they were always good, Honeysuckle Rose. So the trick was to point out to people that it wasn't a new repertoire that Ralph was doing, even though this is a brand new CD. What to expect from mm -hmm. it. it? It's not that he ever played badly, because Ralph, I think was just a wonderful musician but but there were some musicians who tended to do the same repertoire so that was one problem in in covering recordings but there were always people who wanted to have the Ralph Sutton records no matter how many times he did Honeysuckle Rose it didn't matter they yeah. they were gonna have 35 records with Honeysuckle Rose on and that was fine with them so I still felt like we had to cover it um, with some of these bands the the band itself was good the weak point was the vocal yeah that's because there's a forgiveness factor if you're listening to a band live and you hear and somebody's singing but everybody's caught in the moment and it doesn't matter if they're a little off key or yeah maybe it's fun you know, to watch too right, right. Yeah. and so you're you're part of the crowd and what i what i try and do with some recordings if if it's if it's a good band but the vocals are dicey, I will sometimes say to the band, you know, it's really a good recording, but it's kind of problematic because there are a few too many vocals, and what sounds good live doesn't come across necessarily to somebody who's not familiar with the right. band and doesn't. Because people will forgive anything if they know the band and they know yeah, the musicians. they can picture. But and <laughs> I, I, what I try and tell bands is... The people that are reading the rag don't know you. They're going to judge your band based on what they hear on this recording. And if you're singing off key, or if there's something wrong with the vocal, or if somebody is really hitting, the, you know, <laughs> really some clams on it, they aren't going to forgive you for that. They're not, they're going to resent paying money for that recording. Mm -hmm. But it's. It's really dicey. Sometimes uh, we'll run a review, and, and sometimes I would get stuck with writing the review. And I've had some musicians who say to me, um, you're right. We knew when we did this recording that it wasn't up to our standard. Mm -hmm. But they, you know, they tried to slide it in. Other musicians get angry. And so you can't really predict what you're going to get. Uh, and I, I always make it clear that the reviews are subjective. It's, it's one re I, I try and assign the review to somebody who already likes that genre of music mm -hmm. and is knowledgeable. I'm not going to give a ragtime record to somebody who only likes big bands. You know, I try and find somebody who's knowledgeable, but sometimes I get reviews back and I think, oh my God. God, yeah, I'm going <laughs> to run this. Or... <laughs> I'm going to get a brick <laughs> through my window. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Gee. Those those are reviews are just a headache. There, there's no easy way to run right. reviews. Right. Do you have pockets in the country of where your subscribers are? You know, when when I started the rag, I thought it was actually going to be just local, and then up and down the Mississippi River. But when the first issue came out, people mailed it to friends of theirs all over the country. So by the third issue, uh, the rag was in 26 states. It had, wow. it, it had wow. subscribers in 26 states. And early on, it established itself with maybe only one subscriber in Alaska, but in all 50 states. And uh, it's it stayed that way. So it's... It's been in all 50 states and maybe 26 foreign countries. Wow. And that's not a lot in mm. any one of those areas. Yeah. Um, the Chicago area has always been extraordinarily loyal in New England. Those are very mm. strong and loyal areas where they took to the rag early on and have stayed with it. Mm. Very, very loyal, especially Chicago. They've been fantastic. But it, it really is um, quite amazing. And when we switched to online, I said to my sister, well, I, we'll probably have to change our thing about the rag because 
we're probably not in 50 states and 26 countries anymore. And we started tallying it up and she said, you know what, we still really are. You know, there's fewer because we haven't mm -hmm. done all the conversion. But she said it's it still really is international. And so we're still maintaining that balance. But just to wrap up, if someone came to this country, had no idea what traditional jazz was, <laughs> and they thought, well, here's a source. What would you tell them? How how would oh, you define yes. it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a mean question. I know it is. <laughs> how would I define it? Could you describe it? No, because no. I'm not a musician. And that Oh, I bet you could if I really made you. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying no, but to see, now. sometimes sometimes non musicians have much better descriptions of music than musicians do because musicians want to put it into music terms and not mu music terms don't work for everybody unless they're all fellow musicians well do you know that actually I think the Europeans understand traditional jazz better than Americans uh -huh. do they they have a younger audience they are for the most part more knowledgeable about the early artists than a lot of Americans. And if you go to the European jazz festivals, you find everything from little kids to older people at these festivals. Oh. And you find uh, young jazz bands. It, it's, it's really quite remarkable. I think it's more a case of trying to educate the Americans as to what traditional jazz is, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> rather than the Europeans. Right. Um, and even, <laughs> here's, here's one for you. Um, I got a letter for, yeah, it was a letter from Vladivostok from a radio station there because they wanted to give out rag t-shirts as their promotion for their New Year's Eve promotion on their radio station. And oh. and the DJ said he read the rag regularly. <laughs> I have no idea how he wasn't. I mean, they couldn't subscribe way I'll back when, done. but he was familiar with it and he said that their audience was because where Vladivostok was, was Japan and China, you know, in this small area of Russia. And so we sent him t-shirts and he oh. gave, that was, that was going to be their, their prime thing to send out as their promotion for their well, New Year's Eve neat. party. So, Well, people try, if, if they're really into it, they try hard and they figure out how to get what, you know, their passion is. So, well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Well, I, I appreciate that you did that clinic this morning and uh, I hope they can figure out a way to make some headway. I, I do think that, that the jazz, traditional jazz community does need to be more proactive mm -hmm. and submit the proposals and learn how to do it. Yeah. The, the trick is, uh, as I mentioned at the panel this morning, that the older generation doesn't want to bother with it because they're you know, cutting out the festivals or they're kind of retiring from the scene. So it's going to yeah. have to be younger people. Right. And the, the key is trying to convince the younger people to take that responsibility. Right. And I don't know if that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks for your time. Anyway. Well, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>